Hello, and welcome to the Climate Bonds Initiative's 2016 webinar series. Today, we'll be exploring the rail components of our low-carbon transport criteria with Climate Bonds' Rob Fowler, Head of Certification here. We're also joined by Corny Huzenga, Secretary General of SLOCAT, the Partnership on Sustainable Low-Carbon Transport. First, a couple of housekeeping notes. To keep up to date with our work at Climate Bonds and for announcements of future webinars in this series, you can register for our blog at climatebonds.net. If you have any questions as we go through the presentation, please use the Q&A box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. I'll collate them and put them to our presenters at the end. Finally, this webinar will be recorded and sent by email to all those who have registered. Now, over to Rob. Thanks very much, Johnny. Um, welcome, everyone, to this brief webinar. Um, we're going to cover a number of topics in the presentations and then have some time for questions and answers. Um, we're going to look at the green bond market and the role CBI plays, um, talk a bit about the green bond labelling and how standards work, and then look at the climate bond standard and certification scheme. Um, there's some tra transport criteria within, within that scheme and then within that some rail uh, criteria, so we'll talk through the detail and then we'll get some insights from um, Connie. Um, so, moving ahead through the material. The Climate Bonds Initiative is a London-based organisation. Um, we do four different things in the green bond market. Um, we provide a lot of information flows for ratings agencies and index providers. That's a fairly ongoing and serious approach we use to um, feed that data into those market information providers. Um, we do a lot of policy outreach. We are working closely with authorities in China and India and Brazil, other parts of the world, to enhance and, and accelerate the development of green bond markets in those areas. Um, and we look at a variety of different structures and, and uh, developments around securitization or covered bonds and even Islamic finance with Green Sukuk. We have a, a strong partners program and a variety of entities, whether they're governments or corporations or banks, have joined our partners program to step forward and, and take, a, take a role in the formative stages of this market um, when we provide a tailored approach to each of those partners to help them do what they need to do. And of course, we have the Climate Bond Standard and Certification Scheme, and that's the topic for today's presentation uh, in terms of the transport criteria. This provides definitions and guidelines and uh, provides a lot of investor confidence in, in what they're looking to buy. So just quickly, what are green bonds? Um, some people on this call may not be familiar with the bond market or how bonds work, but um, a bond is essentially a form of debt. It's a loan. Um, it's usually used to finance and, and often refinance very large and mature assets. And the, the size of bonds that are issued in the market are usually $100 million or more, um, and sometimes up to a $1 billion at a time. So they're very large slices of, of debt securities. Um, they can be issued by companies. Um, a lot of people know about bonds that are issued by governments, um, but they can also be issued by municipalities and banks, and, and they're used as a, a pretty common form of, of raising capital uh, in the debt markets. They serve as a really important part of portfolios for investors who have um, longer-term perspectives and who have a, an objective to really secure and maintain the funds that they have under management. So pension funds, insurance companies, um, they, they use bonds to um, act as a defensive weight in their portfolios, and that gives them a low-risk approach for retaining and securing the funds they have. Um, a green bond is simply a bond where the proceeds are being used to finance environmentally friendly assets. And in our case, we focus on the climate um, friendly assets. And a green bond is essentially a normal bond in terms of structure and so on, but it's been labelled green because the proceeds are being used in a certain way. Now, in terms of the, the challenge, um, climate solutions need an enormous amount of financial flows, uh, as we know, and the existing mature bond market offers an enormous volume of money that moves every day. So it's a really nice match. One of the key areas that we focus on is what are the assets and what are the different things which qualify as being green or more specifically climate related. 
Um, when we look across the different areas, the different asset classes, with the power grid or transport or, or um, buildings in the built environment or water management, when we look across those different things, the approach we use is to um, create a, a vision for what a 2050 economy looks like with those things in place and a 1.5 degree trajectory or a 2 degree trajectory rather than the 4 or 6 degree trajectories that we're online for at the moment. So we're trying to identify what are the assets that are in place in that world in 2050. And for example, in the power grid, it's, it's zero fossil fuels, it's all renewables and, and so on. Um, in the transport sector, it's zero emissions. In the building sector, it's zero emissions buildings. So it, it's a really transformed economy that we envisage. And then we basically bring that back to what we have in terms of today's assets and understand what of, what of today's assets match those assets that we see in that 2050 vision and therefore are aligned with a low carbon and, and climate secure future. So that's the sort of broader principle we use. As you can see, there's a pretty wide range of different assets and different activities and projects that are in there and um, all the way from what traditionally people think about with solar and wind through to um, transport but also into agriculture as well as ICT and broadband, you know, the, the sort of wiring that's required for a low carbon world. So it's a really interesting range of broad assets. What we've seen lately in, in terms of green bond growth is quite astounding. Um, the early days of the market in 2012 and 13 saw a lot of development banks um, issuing green bonds and they were very well accepted by the market. Um, in 2014-15 we saw corporates and banks really step in and a lot more municipalities. And in 2016 we've seen the rise of China as um, Chinese issuers have stepped in with, with a huge volume of labelled green bonds so far and uh, are expected to ramp up even further in the final part of the year. So our estimate for 2016 is, is still fairly on track at 100 billion, depending on how the Chinese accelerate, but um, we're well above last year's by now. Um, so it's a good sign. There's an interesting range of assets that are being funded by green bonds so far, and um, majority of that is in clean energy with energy efficiency, low carbon buildings sort of following fairly closely. Uh, we're seeing an, an increasing volume of green bond funds going into low carbon transport, and of course that's the topic for today's webinar. And water is also receiving a lot of attention, and, and we're going to see an increase in that as criteria are released and, and people sort of get a deeper understanding of what a low carbon water asset actually looks like. Um, in the bottom section there, the other smaller um, slices of the donor, um, it's not too surprising that those, those activities are, are receiving a relatively low proportion. They don't receive bond funding, traditional bond funding in a huge degree normally, so there is a bit of a, a sort of trend there, but we're looking to expand those, and especially with climate adaptation, I think that's going to be a, a pretty strong growth segment in the coming, coming five years. One thing to note is that all segments are growing. Um, the whole pie is really inflating quite dramatically. So why do people like green bonds? What is it that, that people are interested about? Now, you sort of look at two sides of the coin, the seller and the buyer, because it is a transaction. Um, now, the issuer of the bond, they have a variety of benefits that they see. Um, one of the things they really value is the diversification of investors that they see across different regions and so on. Um, as an issuer of debt capital, it's really useful to have diverse investors who like your paper and like to invest in your entity. So um, a green bond is really attractive investors that they hadn't seen before. So they really appreciate that increased diversification when they start to issue green labelled bonds. They also see that the um, investors want to have more of a discussion about the situation and um, they tend to stick around and, and have a, a greater duration of holding the bond after they buy it. They don't generally sell it into the secondary market as quickly as they would other bonds. And of course, when you do issue a green label bond these days, the oversubscription is quite strong, and so you can open and close your book very quickly. It can reduce your costs of, of marketing and so on. Um, and sometimes we see tighter yields where there's a lot of demand, and so um, the investors are willing to take a small but not material change. Um, of course, on the other side of things for, for an issuer, there's a real strengthening of reputation. We've seen a lot of green bond issuers take advantage of that and use that. Um, and it often is a way to align a lot of corporate social responsibility activities in various operational things and try and bring in the capital raising and, and the funding approach to that sort of aligned approach with CSR across the organisation. So that's the way you should see it. From the investor side, um, we're seeing a lot of investors basically step up and say we want 
green and climate friendly assets to be part of our portfolios. And one of the one of the really interesting things is the demand for green bonds right now far exceeds supply. So there's a lot of investments out there looking to find a, find a home. Um, one of the challenges is that if an investor sees a green bond, they want to know that it's really green enough and they don't have the sort of investor risks that they might have like later down the road if it's not it turns out not to be as green as they would like. So having labelling and certification, those sorts of things, is really useful, but the label in particular. Um, we see identical credit ratings and pricing and structures compared to traditional non-green bonds, and, and that's really important for the mainstream investors to be able to participate. If they have to go back and find a new mandate or do something different, that's difficult for them. So having a, a peri passu approach or a very similar approach between a green and a non-green product is very important. Um, and the secondary markets with the supply and demand balance that we have right now, the secondary markets are responding to that with some premium. Again, investors really like the strength and reputation. They, they value that, and um, particularly asset managers who are looking to win business with big investors, that's a key key part of their motivation. Um, and again, the, the engagement, they, they enjoy much better engagement on this topic. So what about labelling? What, what are standards going to do in this particular market? It's growing really fast, it's got great potential, but what, what are the risks and how can we deal with them? Um, what, what are the things that we notice a lot is the investors are very wary of the greenwashing potential. Um, they generally don't have a huge amount of time or resources to do deep due diligence into these particular investments and their job is generally at a scale where they're looking to um, execute transactions quite quickly in the bond market. So um, they're wary of the risk of greenwashing. Um, so they're really looking for some sort of environmental due diligence process that can be managed by somebody else and, and create a, a label and a standard and, a, and an approach which they can easily understand and identify, um, especially when they can't do this themselves for complex sort of assets or, or a diverse range of different assets that are often small and brought into a, a portfolio to create the scale required for bond issuance. So um, what they're looking for is a scientifically approach, scientifically robust approach. Um, transparency around what's happening and, and a level of consistency so that they don't have to look at each one in turn in detail. Um, what we see at the moment is that the green bond labelling market is evolving quite quickly. Um, we're seeing a, a lot of different dimensions here in terms of reach. We see it's voluntary at the moment. There, there are some mandatory regulatory sort of approaches being introduced and that's great, interesting to see, particularly in China. Um, and we see a lot of use of guidelines and recommended principles as a start for how people can, can get started on these things and of course the climate bond standard is a key step there. Um, the, the scope of these, uh, I suppose, labelling approaches is really trying to cover off on the main issues at, at play. One is how the management of funds works and what the process is and what assets are, are being sort of included, um, how they're included. There's reporting requirements, of course, and investors like to see regular reports, so that's one of the things that is, is uh, a focus. And then, of course, what is a green enough asset? What assets do count as green? And, and that's a key, key area that we're going to talk about uh, today. In terms of the assurance process, that's also an interesting area. Um, we started out with the, the development banks and others who had their own internal approaches to assuring what was going on on the ground and what the assets were. Um, that, that was okay for the first couple of years. As we started to get corporates entering the market, they used second parties, usually sustainability consulting firms to, to provide or research institutes to provide a second party assessment of what they were doing. And now as we see the market maturing, we're seeing a more um, thorough approach to third party verification where there's a level of clear independence and um, a structured and, and repeatable approach to stepping through the checks. So it's an interesting way that that's matured over time. As we've seen from um, the history of green bond labelling, it, it's been a, a a very quick and interesting process for it to get to this stage where we have now um, a variety of different approaches. Um, we're starting to see ratings agencies also move into this space and um, we're seeing a, an interesting attention to the use of standards and certification. Uh, so as we've seen the Green Bond principles, they've been a major force in the last few years, um, driving a level of consistency across the way Green Bonds are labelled and what information is provided by the issuer for the market and the investors. Um, the climate bond standard takes that a step further and uh, we'll talk a bit about that in a bit more detail. And uh, we're starting to see some interesting regulatory approaches within particular countries and we're likely to see more of that with uh, a key example being China so far.
<clears throat> looking forward with the green bond market, um, there's a real demand for credible and quality products. And I think even though there's a, a big difference between supply and demand right now, there's still a considered approach to what people are willing to buy. Um, we've seen seen and heard the call for standards assurance and certification again and again. And so we're um, looking towards how that can provide confidence and transparency. Um, unfortunately, if, if we don't see robust standards, then um, we don't. We may see a, a lessening impact of this sort of labelling. So it's a risk we're trying to address as the market matures. And of course, governments have a key role, and, and regulators and so on have a key role um, to get involved and, and make sure this market retains a level of integrity and success. Now, of course, harmonisation is, is a really important part of all bond markets, just the way they work and the way they operate in the traditional sense. And so harmonisation of green standards and harmonisation of green labelling across jurisdictions is really important. The international institutional investors are, are the group we really want to mobilise here, and so we need to have a good level of harmonisation. Moving on to the, the climate bond standard and certification scheme. Now, this is a scheme that's essentially creating a robust and, and effective approach to certification um, so that you can see a bond and see that it's certified. That's the real, that's the real objective here. Um, we're trying to look at the eligibility criteria for projects and assets. Um, we're trying to create mandatory requirements around how the issuer manages the proceeds and tracks and reports. Um, this is a bit different to the green bond principles, which are principles, so we've taken those and made them into mandatory requirements. Um, and we include an assurance framework with independent verifiers, and, and that provides a really nice level of consistency and rigour. Uh, now, the certification is actually awarded by a climate bond standard board. Now, that's a, a group of people from institutional investors and, and associations and groups, as well as NGOs, um, and they have a very large asset under management. They're very serious people, and they provide all the actual certification decisions, which I think is a really nice peer group for investors to see and understand and, and to therefore value that certification decision with a certain level of understanding. Um, the Green Bond Principles are fully integrated into the Climate Bond Standard, so if you do get certified, you're fully aligned with Green Bond Principles. And people like to see that, that we're building on these things, not making it different. And there's a pretty broad range of bond types and other types of debt instruments that are eligible for certification. So um, that's another key feature. We're not trying to just have a narrow focus, but it is around debt. It's important to note that the climate bond standard is not a financial standard. It's purely focused on the environmental attributes and the reporting and tracking. Um, so investors really do need to do their own credit analysis. It doesn't substitute for credit analysis, and um, how it impacts on, on those things is, is still a topic of some contention. Now, in practice, the standards work by trying to create um, some pretty clear requirements and align with what normally happens in the bond market. So the way bonds are issued, it's usually a fairly quick process uh, at the outset um, to put it together and hit the market at a certain time. So the, the time prior to issuance is usually sometimes a bit short. Um, after the issuance has occurred and the money actually flows into the various things that it was meant to flow into, that's the post-issuance phase and of course there's a bit more time then. So we've really split the, the certification process into those two phases to give people a, a level of confidence around how it works in line with what they normally do to issue a bond. Um, the standard itself has two pieces, I suppose. One is a parent standard that talks about the general requirements for reporting and tracking and, and those sorts of things, managing proceeds. And then, of course, for each of the different asset classes that are identified, we have sector-specific criteria. And today we're talking about the transport criteria. Now, the certification process is also outlined in the standard, and that's a key sort of step, step, step sort of thing that needs to happen so that this can happen efficiently and, and the transaction costs can be kept very low. Now, the range of different assets which are eligible for certification are really guided by the taxonomy um, and within that, the technical criteria for each of those asset classes. So you can see the, the big tick there next to some of those things. That's where we have technical criteria already available, um, developed by technical working groups, and the other colours there indicate how we're moving through the rest of those topics. And uh, it's, a, it's a task, but it's getting done, so we're very excited to see some of the, the um, land use and water and, and other sort of areas really coming to fruition from the hard work of the, of the groups and the Secretariat. The process for certification is, is fairly straightforward. It, it's really creating a, a set 
set of steps for the issuer and the verifier to follow. Um, we've created a variety of templates and documents that allow them to do this. Um, the issuer really needs to set up their own green bond framework internally. That's a key step at the start. Um, once they have that framework, well, um, it's a fairly straightforward process to provide us with some information, make sure they've got the latest versions of things, then get a verifier involved and uh, undertake that first check at the pre-issuance stage. Um, once they get the report from the verifier, they provide all of that to us and the standards board confirms the certification at the pre-issuance. And that lets them use the certification mark for all their marketing activities and their roadshow and the other ways they want to promote the, the product and the, and the bond to others. Um, in terms of post-issuance, once the, the bond has been issued or the book's closed and, and the legals go through, um, then the you know, proceeds begin to be allocated to those projects and assets they've nominated. Um, the verifier then comes back in and has a look at that, pro provides an assurance opinion over what he sees and what they see. Um, those, they, that report and an updated form are provided to us again and the standard board confirms that the certification is retained. Now the pre-issuance certification lasts for up to one year after issuance. Um, the post-issuance certification lasts for the term of the bond, the rest of the bond. Now, there's a few different participants here. As you can see in this, this slide on the left-hand side, the standards board, some logos from the members there. Um, we've had a good variety of issuers to date, and uh, we're starting to see really nice diversity, diversification of different types of issuers, from banks refinancing loans through to um, municipality authorities, um, and of course, um, larger entities like development banks. We've also seen some, some corporate issuance, which is great to see. Um, and of course, we have a variety of different verifiers who service the issuers and provide that verification service. Um, they range from the big four providers of accounting and audit through to more specialized entities and, and some that come from the uh, sustainability and uh, CSR and uh, ESG sort of area of investment. So let's dive into some transport criteria and, and really focus on how this works in practice for the sort of assets that are being being put together. Um, I know that the uh, the transport area is, is a huge focus and I think we'll hear from Corny about some of the more specific initiatives underway, but it's a, it's a massive area of, of attention for achieving this transformation. Um, the investments required are substantial and the current investments are insufficient. So there's a real need to scale up and shift the investment. And of course, debt capital markets are enormous in terms of their volume of cash available and how it is used. And so it's, it's a fantastic place to start. What we see in, in terms of bonds that are issued already, um, bonds are really quite commonly used to fund major transport projects. And we've seen a long legacy of that all the way back to the bonds used for the US uh, transcontinental railways and other things like that. Um, we've seen China use uh, an enormous volume of bonds to fund their uh, massive rollout of high-speed rail across the country. And, and so we expect to see bonds to be continue to be used in this way for, for the future. Um, what we do each year is we actually survey the climate-aligned bonds, not just the ones that are labelled green, but the ones which are not labelled but still fund climate-aligned assets. And this survey each year is available. It's our State of the Market report. It's available on our website. And, and within the transport team, we found uh, over 1,500 bonds from almost 150 issuers and almost you know, 500 billion US dollars outstanding. So a very large slice uh, really dominates the, the, the climate line bond universe, with, with in particular China Railway Corporation also dominating within that rail sector. Um, we have uh, almost 9 billion of um, trans of bonds that are labelled green as well, <clears throat> and we see um, cities ramping up their efforts there. And of course, we have some certified climate bonds already from entities such as the New York Metropolitan Transportation Authority. They've issued a couple, and will continue to issue. Um, we've got some from the Treasury Corporation of Victoria with a portfolio bond heavily weighted towards transport. And uh, Axis Bank has also issued. They had some refinancing of of transport assets as well. So we're, we're great, looking to see a, a great ramp up in both the green labelling and also the certification. So for certification, which assets are really low carbon enough in transport? And what we've done here and the technical working group has created this approach is the objective really trying to find projects and assets that would contribute to that low carbon um, 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius future. 
And that's really that visioning process of 2050 and bringing it back to what we see now and how that transformation can occur. So they decided to set universal thresholds for CO2, um, direct emissions per passenger kilometre or freight kilometre, tonne kilometre for freight. Um, and this really is meant to apply for all tra land transport modes um, to give, a, I suppose, an even, even playing field to a degree, um, but it's also decreasing over time. So there's a fairly, um, I suppose, stringent approach to start with. It was the numbers that are being used for 2015, but then they declined quite rapidly over to 2050. So this is um, a threshold approach that we've seen in other areas of the standard, such as low carbon buildings, and really does provide that guidance for how we can get to a very low carbon future quite quickly. If we look at the actual eligibility criteria for the different transport assets, um, we cover, of course, a wide variety here. There are a couple of other types of transport assets, such as marine transport, which will be covered in the future and are being looked at right now by technical working groups. We cover private light duty vehicles and heavy goods vehicles, so that really is the vehicle stock, the, the cars and the trucks and the buses and all those things around the place. Um, we look at public passenger transport, and that includes, I suppose, different varieties of those, whether they're electrified or, or fossil fuel powered, um, and what sort of uh, rolling stock they have, or how they work. We look at uh, freight railway lines as well, and of course, um, we consider all of the supporting infrastructure for these things, because they're critical to make that infrastructure real and enable those rail assets to actually operate. So I'll dive in a little bit to just the rail aspects here. Um, we will have another webinar to cover the private light duty and heavy goods vehicles, so the cars and trucks and so on, um, and so I'll leave that for today. But the other areas are very much focused on rail, and we'll talk about those. What we do with most of our criteria within the climate bond standard is we try and use a traffic light approach, which is probably suitable for transport as well. And we're trying to create an easy way for uh, owners of assets or owners of financing instruments to identify which assets do qualify, which ones don't, and then which ones need a bit more assessment or a deeper analysis to really make sure. So we use a green light, red light, amber light approach. And, and that's really trying to create a simple an easy way. For example, in rail, uh, the green light assets are any electrified rail systems and the rolling stock associated with those. Um, that's really important and, and makes it easy for operators and owners of those sorts of assets to um, very quickly and easy, uh, easily identify that their assets are eligible. Um, it, of course, includes uh, electrified rail, but trams, trolleybuses, cable cars, all sorts of light rail adaptations that we're seeing around the place. Um, and that's a really important um, I suppose, variety of different things we're seeing, but all within the electrified space. So once they're electrified, that's, that's good enough. What we see in terms of the power grid feeding that electricity, that's a separate issue that needs to be transformed, but the actual assets that run the public, infrastructure, public transport with these electrified systems is what we're looking at. In terms of red light, what is excluded, um, this is really the infrastructure and rolling stock, the transport systems that are enabling fossil fuels and, and transporting fossil fuels. And whether if it's a dedicated fossil fuel line or it's something that's tra tracking more than 50% of its tonne kilometres as fossil fuel transport, then again, those, those assets are excluded. And in between there, we have the amber light, which assets which must meet this universal performance criteria I've just spoken about. And it's a per passenger kilometre or per tonne kilometre number, and we expect systems to do a quick calculation there and understand whether they're inside or outside that threshold. Uh, what we find is that rail assets are almost always inside that threshold, given, given the way it works. So in practice, what does this mean? Um, it means that all urban rail systems essentially are included, it's, unless they're fossil fuel, but even so, their, their profile is generally under the threshold. We see all high-speed rail systems, electrified high-speed rail, as, as being a very important part of this, um, and all of those qualify. Electrified freight rail systems qualify, of course, and for anything that's not electrified or has fossil fuels running across it, then there are universal thresholds that can be met. Now, within those systems, what are we including? It includes all rail infrastructure, the rolling stock, as well as the supporting infrastructure that enables those systems to operate effectively. Um, the associated land, which is part of those assets, are also included, and, and so it's a really broad range of different things that can be rolled up into these systems. We see a lot of refinancing. Um, there's a lot of assets that have been put in place, and the refinancing of those assets, is, especially with 
uh, debt being so cheap, money being so cheap at the moment, we see that as a really interesting opportunity. It doesn't necessarily have to be new assets that are being financed with green bonds. It can be existing assets, that's fine. Um, and of course, we do see new assets being financed, often with uh, a larger government or transport authority using its balance sheet to issue um, bonds, which are generally low risk, for funding of, of new, higher risk uh, build out of infrastructure. What we also see in the, in the rail sector is um, a preference for programmatic issuance of, of certified climate bonds. And, and this is where a fairly large stack of assets, eligible transport assets such as rail systems and so on, rolling stock, um, bridges or signalling systems, all those things can be rolled up into a stack and, and they're often many billions of dollars worth of assets. And so the issuer can then essentially issue certified climate bonds um, against that stack of assets over time. And that builds a lot of momentum for the issuer in terms of its presence in this market and the, the message it's trying to send. Uh, it really creates a lot more investor loyalty because they know that if they go into the first deal, then there are going to be future deals available. And if it goes well, they have a reduced transaction cost to get those future deals. Um, and of course, in terms of public awareness, if that's part of the motivation for the issuer, then he's doing it again and again, really just continues to create that sense that this is something that's happening in the finance world world as well as the practical world. Okay, with that, I'm going to hand over to Johnny to introduce Corny and get us going with the next part of the webinar. Thanks very much and I look forward to the Q&A. Thanks, Rob. We are now joined by Corny Huizenga, Secretary General of SlowCapt, which is the Partnership on Sustainable Low Carbon Transport. For well over 10 years, Corny has been involved in multilateral processes to link the overarching priorities of poverty eradication and sustainability with the development and promotion of low carbon transport policies. As part of that, he was a member of the technical working group who developed the low carbon transport criteria we've just looked at. Are you there, Corny? I am here. Uh, so uh, can people hear me as well? So then, yeah, we can uh, hear you loud and clear. Very good. Now I'll go ahead. And first of all, uh, a big thank you to Rob for doing all the heavy lifting uh, on uh, explaining the, the, the Climate Bonds Initiative, the Climate Bonds and the, the transport criteria. So, so I think that that makes my work uh, relatively easy. What I wanted to do is, uh, in my presentation is to talk briefly about uh, what is happening in the global arena with respect to sustainable transport. And I think that this is relevant, uh, listening to, to what, what Rob was saying, because, because I think it, it really outlines why we feel that, uh, that there is a growing interest in, uh, in, in sustainable transport. And did, uh, this, this is based on six uh, recent uh, global agreements. So, I think that in the international arena, uh, we actually see that uh, in 2015 and 2016, that there were six uh, relevant global, uh, glo global agreements, which all have the potential to, to, to spur action on, uh, on transport. Huh? So the first one is the global decade of action on, on the road safety. So you might ask that you say like, why is road safety relevant if we talk about climate bonds initiatives? But uh, I think that Rob made a reference to, to urban uh, mass transit. And he made uh, a lot of references to rail transport. People who travel by rail are far less likely to be killed in, in transport. At the moment, we have 1.3 million uh, people who are killed each year in, in traffic accidents. And most of these are car-based uh, accidents. So if we are able to, to shift transport from cars to rail, we will be able to make progress uh, on road safety as well as on climate. And the second is the, the Financing for Development Conference, which took place last year in, uh, in Addis Ababa. And there was a very strong uh, commitment there towards sustainable infrastructure. And for those of you who have followed the the G20 meeting, which just completed here in China, in Hangzhou, that you will also, uh, you, you also heard a lot of references there to sustainable infrastructure. So this is again something which we think works in, in favor of, of sustainable transport and which would also work in favor of the green climate bonds. And then last year in September, we had the adoption of the sustainable development goals. Uh, 
the Sustainable Development Goals is a process uh, which started in the year 2000 with the Millennium Development Goals, where the global community came together and they say, we need to accelerate action on, on health care, on poverty alleviation, slum eradication, and a number of uh, a number of uh, other social issues. At the Rio Plus 20 conference uh, in 2012, there was an agreement that the Millennium Development Goals had been successful in changing the direction of uh, global development policies, and that uh, upon their uh, termination in 2015, that we would need to have a new set of goals. And this has become the Sustainable Development Goals. In this, uh, there are sustainable development goals on health, on energy, on, on cities, etc. And transport plays an important role in this. So we expect that on the basis of the sustainable development goals that we will see accelerated action on, uh, on, on sustainable uh, transport. Then last year in Paris, uh, we had the, the Paris Agreement on, on, on climate change, which was really unprecedented in the sense that uh, when the transport sector went to, to, to Paris, uh, like other sectors, we say we would have a very successful conference if there is an agreement around a two-degree scenario, which means a maximum increase of temperature by two degrees. Uh, and what happened during the conference was that the participants actually said, or that the government said, this is not ambitious enough and we need to be more, uh, we need to go beyond this and we need to go to 1.5 degrees. I think that this is relevant, and I think that Rob also spoke about this, uh, for the transport sector because it puts a greater responsibility on the transport sector to reduce its emissions. Uh, transport is not the easiest sector to, to reduce emissions, and the, uh, the more ambitious the global target is, so instead of 2 degrees, a 1.5 degree uh, target, it means that we can no longer just depend on other sectors, and it means that transport has to also reduce its emissions by about 80 percent. Mm -hmm. Then, this year, there was an important conference in, uh, in Nairobi, uh, the UNCTAD conference, uh, which is a conference on trade and development. Mm -hmm. In this conference, uh, for the first time, there was a lot of discussion on, uh, on transport. People argue that, say, if we are going to get more trade, this will also mean more transport. Mm -hmm. And if we want to do that, we need to make certain that this transport is sustainable. So this is another impetus, like if we speak about rail transport, it's clear that rail transport is not only for the movement of people, but we would also like to see that, that more freight is moved by, uh, by railway as well. Then the last conference, which is the conference which will take place in October uh, of this year in, uh, in Ecuador, in Quito, the Habitat 3 conference, which is on urban development, uh, the draft outcome document of this conference also speaks very strongly about the need to accelerate the investments in public transport. And so altogether, you could say that uh, these six global agreements have, in the last two years, really changed the, the, the setting uh, for transport. And, and so it provides us with opportunities, but at the same time, it also provides us with responsibilities. And this is something why we are happy to partner with the Climate Bonds Initiative to, to broaden the, the, the funding sources on, uh, on, on, on sustainable transport. Huh? Uh, so we have been active uh, in all of these processes and uh, in the slide here that you can see some of these examples. We just want to, to flag uh, one here, which is the, the transport days. During these international conferences, increasingly we are uh, we are organizing uh, we are organizing uh, a transport day where we bring together all the, the 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 stakeholders on transport with the idea like that we say how can we accelerate action on this and so we will do be doing that this year again as well in Marrakesh uh, during the COP as well as in uh, Quito during the Habitat uh, conference. So, if we want to have greater investments in transport, uh, it's clear that countries, as well as private sector, as well as cities, need to take the initiative. So, it is clear that 
if we go to the to the stakeholders and tell them that we have six agreements with 14 targets and with 35 indicators, that we are not very successful in communicating the, the, the message on sustainable transport. So what we are doing at the moment in 2016 is that, that we say like in order to streamline the, the communication towards the, the stakeholders who need to make the decisions on policies and investments, is that we say that we are we are bundling these six agreements into three outputs. Uh, we're talking about a common framework, so we would like countries uh, to embrace a common framework that sets out goals on transport, sustainable development, and climate change, and connect to that uh, a number of key indicators. And then secondly, that we say that we would like to develop a global roadmap to decarbonize the transport sector. If you take the examples uh, of Rob, which he mentioned about rail transport, uh, many of the railways that we travel on at the moment were built, uh, let's say, 50 or 100 years ago. Like, if you look at locomotives, which are put on the railways, these are, uh, these are in, 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 uh, in, in function for periods of 30 to 50 years. So it is important to provide decision makers with a medium to long-term perspective on what needs to be done in the transport sector. You could say that the Paris Agreement potentially can lead to the largest transformation in the transport sector since we started to since we started using motorized transport and this is why we say it's important not only to look at the short term but really present countries with a long term perspective and the last one is uh, what we call uh, quick wins and it's clear that while you talk to governments about a medium to long term roadmap that there are certain actions that can be taken now already and so on the next three slides, uh, we have elaborated a, a little bit more on these three products. So on this slide, you see something on the common framework. So what we're saying is that in this common framework, which is currently still in draft format, we say we would like to have four goals, one on access, one on efficiency, one on safety, and one on climate. Briefly, something on the access. Hmm? If we talk about sustainable transport, there is sometimes a tendency that people say we need to have less transport or we need to make uh, we need to make the existing transport more sustainable. What is important is to realize that at the moment the expectation is that between now and 2050 we will be adding 2.5 billion people to the urban population, which is roughly equivalent to the current population of China, India. At the same time, we know that in the rural areas, there is still about 1 billion people who do not have access to all to an all-season road. So it means that if we talk about sustainable transport, if we talk about low carbon or green transport over the next years, we're doing that in the context of a, uh, of, of a growing market uh, for, for, for transport services. Eh? So with respect to the roadmap, um, this is a medium to long-term uh, process. And we say that for the developed countries, we are aiming for a decarbonization of the transport sector roughly by 2050 or 2060 but at the same time that the developing world will be slower, and this is why we say that we're talking about a roadmap uh, for roughly uh, 2080. In the roadmap, we're talking about uh, eight components at the moment. We need to change the way that we do transport in the cities. We need to change the energy supplies for transport, and I think that this is why, I think in terms of uh, the, the real uh, climate bonds, we're talking about electric transport. At the same time, we need to improve efficiency, and that applies both to, uh, to, to cars, uh, to trucks, uh, but it also applies to, uh, to, to the railway sector. And we are very happy to see that the International Association of Railways has made a commitment last year uh, at, the, at the COP in Paris to improve the efficiency of railways with, by 75% uh, by 2050 compared to 1990. We need to shorten the supply chains so that uh, if we drink bottled water from Fiji in, uh, in the UK, 
that it's clear that this has a considerable impact on, uh, on emissions. We need to reduce unnecessary travel by greater use of uh, uh, online uh, media. Uh, we need to not forget the rural areas, and at the same time, we need to realize and accept that, uh, that adaptation is equally important as mitigation. And I'm happy to hear that, uh, that Brock was actually uh, referring to that as well as, as a growth market uh, in, in, in the bond sector and in the climate bond sector. And all of this needs to be supported by financial and uh, regular, uh, regulatory tools. So in terms of ambition level, we clearly need to aim at the 1.5 degree scenario. It's also important to know that if we want to do things at scale, that it's important to realize that a lot of the building blocks are in place already. Like if you talk, for example, about the railway sector, we know uh, how to build the railways, we know how to build the high-speed rail, we know how to do electric railways, so, so we can really move very quickly on that. We need to make innovation uh, take center stage because there is obviously always a scope to, to further improve. It's also in terms of the energy supply of the transport sector. I get the moment we talk a lot about electricity, but uh, research is and, and should be ongoing with respect to hydrogen. What is important is also to understand that to achieve uh, low carbon transport, that this can not only be done by technological means. It's not just a question of improving the existing technologies. We also need to think about how can we shift transport from less efficient modes to more efficient modes. And, uh, coming back to the example of railways, that currently a lot of the freight transport is, uh, is done by roads. If we would be able to shift that to the railways, we would really have a great deal, uh, uh, a great improvement in lowering of transport-related emissions. And, and obviously, like the various institutions uh, need to work together on this. Uh, so then uh, the, the quick wins, uh, it's clear that uh, there are all kinds of measures that can be taken at this moment uh, the, before 2020, which would really put the transport sector on, the, on track towards a, a more sustained uh, transformation. Examples of that is the phase out of fuel, fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, currently we're spending globally $500 billion on uh, subsidizing fossil fuels. We can tighten fuel economy standards, which is, uh, goes back to the regulatory efforts that Rob referred to. We can introduce uh, sustainable urban mobility plans, and we can come up with uh, freight recognition uh, schemes, which would really also promote uh, the efforts in the, in, the, in the freight sector. So by taking this three elements together, the common framework, the quick win actions, and the, and, uh, and, uh, the global roadmap, we think that we are on the right track. Just uh, briefly uh, to talk about trillions as well. Uh, in this slide, you, you see, a, let's say, a schematic uh, overview of the transport emissions. Uh, you can see, like, what is the business as usual, the two degree scenario and the 1.5 degree scenario. So, so the green scenario really indicates that by 2050, we need to reduce emissions by 80%. So, uh, and uh, people are at the moment in the process of estimating what would be the, the investments needed. And overall, for all sectors, uh, we would have to, we would probably need about $13.5 trillion in terms of investments, uh, what was estimated last year. And that in terms of transport, it, it's uh, that we say that currently, we invest already $1.5 trillion uh, a year. And the estimate is that in order to increase the sustainability of transport systems, that, systems that we would need an additional $3 trillion between now and 2035 to make this happen. So, and that's, that really outlines the, the need for, 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 for climate bonds because it, it is clear that we really need to scale up uh, financing uh, facilities. It's clear that financing needs to come from the public sector, it needs to come from the private sector, from traditional bonds, but also from, uh, from, from, from climate bonds. Then uh, for the sustainable development goals, which were adopted last year, uh, there are also estimates which have been made uh, about additional investments, and again, 
that this also runs in the trillions. And I think it's important to realize that these additional investments which are needed are about 10 to 15 times the available ODA. So it's, it's clear that we cannot rely on traditional sources of financing and that we need to come up with new and innovative uh, sources of financing. So then, uh, briefly, like why are we excited uh, about the, the Climate Bonds Initiative Low Carbon Transport Standard? Is that we see that, that there is a very strong linkage with what, between what we are trying to do and what, what CBI is trying to do. Like it's clear that we need ambitious action to decouple transport emissions from economic growth and that this can only be achieved through journey avoidance and modal shift and fuel supply shifts. That it's also clear that the, the decarbonization of transport requires more than an incremental change. Like we need to, uh, we really need to have transformational change and we need to have system change. Yeah? And that uh, the, the last point is that we say is that, uh, that the potential for radical decarbonization is dependent on a broader climate policy. Like it's clear that if we talk about using uh, electric uh, elect electricity for, uh, for 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 railways or uh, let's say uh, what you will hear about in the subsequent uh, webinar, also for on the road vehicles, it's clear that we also say that we need to have clean electricity. Uh, in the discussions in the technical working group for the climate bonds initiative, we say like it is important to have criteria which on the one hand have the, the rigor to, to ensure uh, that, that we are not doing greenwashing as was mentioned before, but at the same time we also need to have some flexibility uh, to, to meet the needs of an evolving sector. So, so that is why we, uh, in the technical working group, that we agreed that we need to have, uh, let's say, a fairly broad criteria rather than to have very detailed individual criteria for individual subsectors. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to hand over back to Johnny. Thanks so much, Corny. Great to get some context on the wider landscape in which our criteria sits. Just a reminder that you can ask a question by using the Q&A box in the bottom right-hand corner. We've already had a couple. Uh, let's start with this one. Uh, Corny touched on it on the last slide. All electrical rail systems are considered green in your criteria's approach. That inherently assumes that electricity consumed will be green. In such a scenario, do you consider a country or region's plan to reduce emissions in power generation in the power generation sector? Rob, do you want to do you want to answer that one? Yeah, thanks, Johnny. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep, loud and clear. Excellent. Um, so what we've done here is we've tried to isolate the assets in the transport sector, which are part of that low carbon future. Now the assets in the power generation sector in that low carbon future definitely need to be different to what we see today. But that's the criteria that we're applying in the power sector around solar and wind and excluding all coal and gas, that's the sort of thing we can do there. In terms of transport assets, the electrified rail systems as assets themselves are part of that 2050 vision. And so no, we don't look at the um, electricity consumed or the emissions intensity of that electricity. That's not part of the, the criteria. Um, we see the power sector revolution, the transformation of the power sector will happen in parallel. Um, and so it's a matter of identifying the assets which are part of that future vision. Yeah, so uh, Johnny, if I could say something on that as well. Of course. Uh, because, uh, this, this was a discussion that we also had with respect to electric vehicles. Um, so. Uh, some people argue that you should not go ahead with uh, changing the transport sector until uh, the, the green electricity is there. What I mentioned is the, in my presentation is the lifetime of uh, infrastructure and, and vehicles. So uh, if you look, for example, at, uh, at, at locomotives, uh, locomotives have a lifetime of more than 30 years. So if we would say that we would be holding back on uh, investing in railways because we say we are not entirely certain, uh, let's say, how green the electricity is, that it means that, that you actually uh, put an incentive to, uh, to people to transport freight by, uh, by, by road. Once the, the freight transport is on the road, it's very difficult to bring it back to the rail. So the sooner 
that we can move transport to the to the rail, even if the electricity is not entirely green at this moment, and if it comes from, from a coal-fired power plant, we still consider this as uh, preferential over the alternative is that, that if the freight would be transported by, by road. Huh? Thank you, Corny. Uh, another question here, do you include intangible assets in the other assets supporting railway development, e.g. traffic management software or investing in e-ticket systems? Rob? Yeah, that we do. That's, that's seen as supporting infrastructure to enable the rail operations to happen. And that also includes security infrastructure and other things like that. So we definitely draw a pretty broad circle around what a, what a rail system needs to operate effectively. And of course, those softer aspects are incredibly important, especially these days. So yes, they are included. Yeah, and, and maybe to add to this, that uh, one of the, the things that we were discussing in the technical working group as well is the desirability of having an asset management system. And I think like that uh, when we were discussing the asset management system, I think it's, it's like what Rob was saying is that it, it's important like uh, that, that you really look at, uh, at the entire ecosystem and you look at the entire, uh, the entire system. So, so these things would be included there as well. That, that also to... includes things like the manufacturing facilities for rolling stock, um, similar to the way our wind and solar um, approaches allow to include manufacturing facilities dedicated to those industries. So um, it's a fairly broad range up and down the supply chain as well as across the types of infrastructure that are included. Just time for Do one final question. question. Uh, roughly how much does it cost to certify a green transport bond as green? Are uh, upfront and ongoing costs perhaps a factor in how many bonds are labelled and certified versus not? Okay, yeah, I can quickly cover that before we finish. Um, there are a couple of different uh, types of costs involved. Um, one of the costs is for the issuer of the bond to put together their own internal green bond framework. So that does take a little bit of time, but we've seen those being very brief and, and direct documents, so can be quite quick as well. And uh, the, if they have assets that are easily meeting the criteria, that makes it as simple as well. Um, that document is used not just for the first one, but is used for all the green bonds they issue over time. Um, so that's a one-off cost. Each time they issue a, a bond and want it certified, they need to engage a verifier to do that, and so that's a um, that's a cost that is incurred. Um, similar with the green bond framework, the, the upfront cost is greater than the ongoing ones, um, but each bond does need to be verified by an independent verifier, approved verifier, um, and so that is a cost that we see the cost for, for simple transport bonds ranging from, I think, 10,000 US dollars up to about 20,000 US dollars for verification across the pre-issuance and post-issuance phases. Um, some issuers choose to get their bond verified every year and often included in their annual financial audits, um, but that's a voluntary thing. It's not mandatory to have it re-verified re over time. And the Climate Bonds Initiative charges a small certification fee to try and do some cover some of our administrative costs. Um, that fee is one-tenth of one basis point of the issued principal. So it really comes down to, say you've got a $500 million bond, the certification fee is $5,000. And there are the costs involved. Um, Hopefully that's a useful summary of what's been going on. Johnny, I'll hand it over to you to close. Thanks, Rob. That's all we've got time for today. A big thank you to our guest speaker, Corny, and to Rob for his presentation. Just a reminder that this session was recorded. I'll send links for this to all those who registered afterwards. I'll also include links to sign up for the second part of this webinar. Uh, this will focus on the road-based components of our criteria and will happen in October. To keep up to date with all things climate bonds, including future webinars and our market analysis, you can sign up to our blog on our website, climatebonds.net. Thanks for tuning in and have a good day.